Lesson 12 for March 14 to 20 From North and South to the Beautiful Land Read by Dr Percy Harold Sabbath afternoon, March 14 Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we've seen these prophecies in the book of Daniel. We've seen your hand at work in the lives of just so many people. And we thank you for the support we've seen for faithful Daniel. We pray that as we read this lesson this week, as we open your word, that we too may come to the conclusion that your eternal kingdom is where we're heading, where our aim should be, where our reward will be, but also where you will be. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from Daniel chapter 11 and verse 35. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white, until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Let's read that again, Daniel 11 verse 35. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white, until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. As we begin this challenging chapter, a few points should be made at the outset. First, Daniel 11 stands in parallel overall with the previous prophetic outlines in Daniel. As in chapters 2, 7, 8, and 9, the prophetic message extends from the days of the prophet to the end of time. Second, a succession of world powers emerges, powers that often oppress God's people. Third, each prophetic outline climaxes with a happy ending. In Daniel 2, the stone obliterates the statue. In Daniel 7, the Son of Man receives the kingdom. And in Daniel 8 and 9, the heavenly sanctuary is cleansed through the work of the Messiah. Chapter 11 follows three basic points. First, it begins with the Persian kings and discusses their fates and the time of the end when the king of the north attacks the holy mountain of God. Second, a succession of battles between the king of the north and that of the south and how they affect God's people is described. Third, it concludes with a happy ending as the king of the north faces his demise by the glorious holy mountain, Daniel 11, verse 45. Such a positive conclusion signals the end of evil and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. Sunday, March 15. Prophecies about Persia and Greece. Question. Read Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. What do we see here that reminds us of some of the previous prophecies we have seen in Daniel? Daniel 11, beginning at verse 1. Also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. But not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled." for his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others besides these. Gabriel tells Daniel that three kings will still rise from Persia. They will be followed by the fourth king, who will be the richest one of all and will provoke the Greeks. After Cyrus, three successive kings exert dominion over Persia, Cambyses from 530 to 522 BC, the false Smyrdas, just for 522 BC, and Darius I from 522 to 486 BC. 
The fourth king is Xerxes, mentioned in the book of Esther as Ahasuerus. He is very wealthy and marshals a vast army to invade Greece as predicted in the prophecy. But in spite of his power, he is repelled by a smaller force of valiant Greek soldiers. Let's read Esther chapter 1 verses 1 to 7. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, one hundred and eighty days in all. And, when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan the citadel, from great to small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars, and the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise and white and black marble." and they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. It's not difficult to recognize Alexander the Great as the mighty king who arises in chapter 11 of Daniel, verse 3, and who becomes the absolute ruler of the ancient world. He died at the age of 32 without leaving an heir to rule the empire. So the kingdom was divided among his four generals, Seleucus over Syria and Mesopotamia, Ptolemy over Egypt, Lysimachus over Thrace and portions of Asia Minor, and Cassander over Macedonia and Greece. Question. Compare Daniel 11 verses 2 to 4 with chapter 8 verses 3 to 8 and verses 20 to 22. How do these texts help identify Alexander as the power here. Daniel 11 and verses 2 to 4. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others besides these. And chapter 8, verses 3 to 8. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes, then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before or beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand." Therefore the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And Daniel 8, verses 20 to 22, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king, as for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. 
What can we learn from this assortment of names, dates, places and historical events? First, we learn that the prophecy is fulfilled as predicted by the divine messenger. God's word never fails. Second, God is the Lord of history. We may get the impression that the succession of political powers, leaders and kingdoms is propelled by the ambition of emperors, dictators and politicians of all stripes. However, the Bible reveals that God is in ultimate control and will move the wheel of history according to His divine purpose, which ultimately will lead to the eradication of evil and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. Monday, March 16. Prophecies of Syria and Egypt. Question. Read Daniel, chapter 11, verses 5 to 14. What is unfolding here? Daniel 11, beginning at verse 5. Also, the king of the south shall become strong, as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And at the end of some years they shall join forces. For the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand. But she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who strengthened her in those times. But... From a branch of her roots, one shall arise in his place who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them, and prevail. And he shall also carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Also, the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. However, His sons shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. And the king of the south shall be moved with rage and go out and fight with him, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. When he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up, and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. For the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. Now in those times many shall rise up against the king of the south, also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfilment of the vision, but they shall fall." Upon the death of Alexander the Great, the vast Greek empire was divided among his four generals. Two of them, Seleucus in Syria, that's to the north, and Ptolemy in Egypt, to the south, managed to establish dynasties that would fight each other for control of the land. Most Bible students understand the wars between the king of the north and the king of the south prophesied in Daniel 11 verses 5 to 14 as referring to the many battles involving these two dynasties. According to the prophecy, an attempt would be made to unite these two dynasties by marriage, but that alliance would be short-lived, as we saw in verse 6. Let's just read that one again. Where is it? And at the end of some years they shall join forces, for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand, but she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who strengthened her in those times. Historical sources inform us that Antiochus II Theos, from 261 to 246 BC, grandson of Seleucus I, married Berenice, a daughter of the Egyptian king, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus. However, 
that agreement did not last, and the conflict that directly involved the people of God soon resumed. Thus, Daniel 11 deals with some important events that will touch the lives of God's people during the centuries after the prophet Daniel passes from the scene. Again, we can ask the question of why the Lord reveals ahead of time all these details about wars involving kingdoms fighting each other for supremacy in that part of the world. The reason is simple. These wars affect God's people. So, the Lord announces beforehand the many challenges His people will face in the years to come. Also, God is the Lord of history, and as we compare the prophetic record with the historical events, we can again see that the prophetic word is fulfilled as predicted. The God who predicts the vicissitudes of those Hellenistic kingdoms fighting each other is the God who knows the future. He is worthy of our trust and faith. This is a big God, not an idol manufactured by human imagination. He not only directs the course of historical events, but he also can direct our lives if we allow him to do so. And so to finish today, read Isaiah 46 verses 9 to 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. How much basic Christian theology is found in these two verses, and what great hope can we take from them? Think about how scary verse 10 would be if God were not kind and loving, but vengeful and mean. Tuesday, March 17, Rome and the Prince of the Covenant. Question. Read Daniel chapter 11, verses 16 to 28. Though the text is difficult, what images can you find that appear elsewhere in Daniel? Daniel 11, verses 16 to 28. But he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it. But she shall not stand with him or be for him. After this, he shall turn his face to the coastlands, and shall take many. But a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end, and with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall, and not be found. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle, and in his place shall arise a vile person, to whom they will not give the honour of royalty. But he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. With the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. And after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, For he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil, and riches, and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, 
and they shall speak lies at the same table. But it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. A transition in power from the Hellenistic kings to pagan Rome seems to be depicted in verse eleven, verse 16 of chapter 11. But he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. The glorious land is Jerusalem, an area where ancient Israel has existed, and the new power that takes over that area is pagan Rome. The same event also is represented in the horizontal expansion of the little horn, which reaches the glorious land, as we read in Daniel 8, 9, and out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. So it seems clear that the power in charge of the world at this point is pagan Rome. Some additional clues in the biblical text reinforce this perception. For example, the one who imposes taxes must refer to Caesar Augustus. It is during his reign that Jesus is born, as Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem for the census. Uh, Daniel 11 verse 20. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. Also, according to the prophecy, this ruler will be succeeded by a vile person, in verse 21 of Daniel chapter 11. And in his place shall arise a vile person, to whom they will not give the honour of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. As history shows, Augustus was succeeded by Tiberius, an adoptive son of Augustus. Tiberius is known to have been an eccentric and vile person. Most important, according to the biblical text, it was during the reign of Tiberius that the Prince of the Covenant would be broken. Daniel 11 verse 22 With the force of a flood they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the Prince of the Covenant. This clearly refers to the crucifixion of Christ also called Messiah the Prince in Daniel 9.25. Let's have a look at Daniel 9.25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Let's compare that with Matthew 27 verses 33 to 50. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine, mingled with gall, to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided his garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who stole the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now, about the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Jesus was put to death during the reign of Tiberius. The reference to Jesus here as the Prince of the Covenant is a powerful marker that helps show us the flow of historical events, again giving readers powerful evidence of God's amazing foreknowledge. God has been right on all that has come before in these prophecies, so we can surely trust Him on what He says will happen in the future. To finish the day, even amid all political and historical events, Jesus of Nazareth, the Prince of the Covenant, is revealed in the texts. How does this help show us that, despite all the upheaval and political intrigue, Jesus remains central to Scripture? Wednesday, March 18, The Next Power Question, read Daniel 11, verses 29 to 39. What is this power that arises after pagan Rome? Daniel 11, beginning at verse 29. At the appointed time he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the Holy Covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Those who do wickedly against the covenant he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honour a God of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know he shall honour with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortress with a foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Daniel 11 verses 29 to 39 refers to a new power system. Although this system stands in continuation with the pagan Roman Empire and inherits some characteristics of its predecessor, at the same time it seems to be different in some aspects. The biblical text says that it shall not be like the former or the latter in verse 29. As we look forward, we find that it acts as a religious power. It aims its attack mainly at God and his people. Let us look at some of the actions perpetrated by this king. First, he will act in rage against the Holy Covenant in verse 30. This must be a reference to God's covenant of salvation, which this king opposes. Second, this king will produce forces that will defile the sanctuary and take away the daily sacrifices in verse 31. 
We noted in Daniel 8 that the little horn casts down the foundation of God's sanctuary and takes away the daily sacrifices. That's Daniel 8 verse 11. This must be understood as a spiritual attack against Christ's ministration in the heavenly sanctuary. Third, as a consequence of his attack on the sanctuary, this power places the abomination of desolation in God's temple. The parallel expression transgression of desolation points to the acts of apostasy and rebellion by the little horn in Daniel 8.13. Fourth, this power persecutes God's people. Some of those of understanding shall fall, to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, verse 35 in chapter 11. This reminds us of the little horn which cast down some of the host and some of the stars and trampled them, as we read in Daniel 8.10, and it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them, and in Daniel 7.25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand, for a time, and times, and half a time. Fifth, the king will exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods. Verse 36 of Daniel 11. Unsurprisingly, the little horn also speaks pompous words, as we read in Daniel 7, 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the little horns were plucked up by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words, and even against God in Daniel 7, 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. So to finish the day, other similarities could be mentioned, but considering what we read in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, who is this power? And why is it so important to us, despite social pressures, to stay firm in our identification of it? Thursday, March 19, Final Events Question, read Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. What is happening here? Daniel 11, beginning at verse 40. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels." But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. The following phrases help us understand this text. Time of the end? The expression time of the end appears only in Daniel. In Daniel 8, 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid and fell on my face, but he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. And chapter 11, verse 35, And some of those of understanding shall fall, to refine them, purify them, and make them white, until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. And same chapter, verse 40, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. 
and chapter 12, verse 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And verse 9, And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Examination of Daniel's prophecies indicate that the time of the end extends from the fall of the papacy in 1798 to the resurrection of the dead in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. King of the North This name first geographically designates the Seleucid dynasty, but then it refers to pagan and finally papal Rome. As such, it does not describe a geographical location, but the spiritual enemy of God's people. In addition, we also should note that the King of the North represents a counterfeit of the true God, who in the Bible is symbolically associated with the North as we read in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 13. And Isaiah fourteen thirteen reads, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. King of the South. This name at first designates the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt south of the Holy Land. But, as the prophecy unfolds, it acquires a theological dimension and it is associated by some scholars with atheism. As Ellen G. White commented on the reference to Egypt in Revelation 11 verse 8, says in the Great Controversy, page 269, this is atheism. Revelation 11 8 reads, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The Glorious Holy Mountain. In Old Testament times, this expression referred to Zion, the capital and heart of Israel, and geographically located in the Promised Land. After the cross, God's people are no longer defined along ethnic and geographical lines. Therefore, the holy mountain must be a symbolic designation of God's people spread throughout the world. So perhaps we can interpret events like this. 1. The king of the south attacks the king of the north. The French Revolution attempted to eradicate religion and defeat the papacy, but failed. 2. The king of the north attacks and defeats the king of the south. The forces of religion headed by the papacy and its allies will eventually overcome the forces of atheism and will form a coalition with the defeated enemy. 3. Edom, Moab and the prominent people of Ammon will escape. Some of those, not counted among God's true people, will join the fold in the last hour. 4. The king of the north prepares to attack the holy mountain, but comes to his end. The forces of evil are destroyed and God's kingdom is established. So to finish today, how can we draw comfort from knowing that in the end, God and his people will be victorious? Friday, March 20. It is interesting that at least in reference to Daniel 11:28 to 29, Martin Luther identified the abomination of desolation in Daniel 11:31 with the papacy and its doctrines and practices. Thus the correlation of Daniel 11 with Daniel 7 and 8 reinforces the view of Luther and many other Protestant commentators that the institution of the papacy and its teachings constitutes the fulfilment of these prophecies in history. In this connection, Ellen White wrote in The Great Controversy, page 62, No church within the limits of Romish jurisdiction was long left undisturbed in the enjoyment of freedom of conscience. 
No sooner had the papacy obtained power than she stretched out her arms to crush all that refused to acknowledge her sway, and one after another the churches submitted to her dominion. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. How can we be sensitive to the feelings of others, yet not compromise on what the Bible teaches regarding the role of Rome in the last days? 2. Daniel 11.33 reads, And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. What does this text say about the fate of some of God's faithful people? What does the text say, too, about what some of these faithful people are doing before they are martyred? What message is there for us today? 3. Daniel 11.36 reads, Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. Of whom and what does this remind you? Well, we're going to look at Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 17. Now you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet, you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Who did not open the house of his prisoners? And... Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And four. Daniel eleven twenty-seven, twenty-nine, 29 and 35 use the phrase Lomo Ed, the appointed time. What does this tell us again about God's control of history? Daniel 11, verse 27. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table, but it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. And verse 29. At the appointed time he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter, and verse 35, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Heart for Mission and it's by Joyce. Joyce is a 25-year-old global mission pioneer who, with another female global mission pioneer, planted a church for young people in a city of 10 million people. Because she lives in a closed country hostile to Christianity, Adventist Mission is not publishing her full name or location. Here's what Joyce said when asked by editor Andrew McChesney Why did you decide to be a missionary? I have one sister, Sarah, and she was born with a congenital heart defect. My grandmother was very worried and she looked and looked for the best hospital. But the doctors couldn't help Sarah. So my grandmother visited our traditional places of worship to ask for help, but no one there could help my sister. Finally, the doctor told my parents that he could do nothing more. 
Take care of Sarah as best as you can, he said. If she wants something special to eat or a new toy, give it to her to make her happy. One day, when Sarah was seven, a Seventh-day Adventist relative came to visit from far away. She saw that my grandmother was worried about Sarah, and she said, If you believe in Jesus, you will be blessed. The next Sabbath, my grandmother took me to church. I was three. Church members gathered in a circle around us and prayed for us and for Sarah. Just a few days later, Sarah was healed. Her heart was perfect. The doctor couldn't believe it. He ran several medical tests and he couldn't find any problems with Sarah's heart. It was a miracle. The miracle changed my family. My grandmother and my parents started going to church every Sabbath. And soon they were baptised. Then my parents decided that they wanted to tell other people about Jesus. So they quit their jobs, received church training and became global mission pioneers. When my sister grew up, she also became a global mission pioneer. Last year, I decided to become a global mission pioneer. As a missionary, I give Bible studies, I pray with people, and I preach. I work with a partner, another global mission pioneer who is 23, and we just opened a new church for young people in this city. Relatives who aren't Christians don't understand why I'm a missionary. They tell me to look for another job. Sometimes I feel discouraged when I hear such negative words, but my parents pray for me. My mother even fasts and prays for me on Sabbaths. My parents remind me that I am not working for man. I am working for God. My parents are right. I am working for God. God is so wonderful and powerful in healing my sister. I believe God is leading me every step of the way. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.